Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar. Uh, thank you very much for your time and interest um, in our um, RFP partnership for preparing clinical trials as for GCP compliant phase three lesser fever vaccine efficacy trial and long term research preparedness. Uh, before we go through the agenda and start the presentations as well as the discussion, uh, we are pleased that our executive director of research and development, Melanie Savile, has joined us to um, provide a brief welcome and give an introduction. So she has to leave um, very early today, so I will directly hand over to her. Thanks, Mel, for joining. The floor is yours. Great. And thank you, Christoph. I hope you can all hear me clearly. Um, and really just wanted to, to welcome everybody to um, this webinar. So this obviously is really to support applications coming through for the research preparedness uh, request for proposals um, for, for West Africa. And perhaps for those of you who are not so familiar with CEPI, so CEPI was set up as an organization um, that would accelerate vaccine development for emerging infectious diseases. And through what we've learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, really looking in the future to be much better prepared for epidemics and pandemics, with a view to in the future being in a situation where all regions would be able to respond uh, to a pandemic in the context of developing a vaccine um, towards 100 days. Um, as you all know, in, in the COVID-19 pandemic, the first vaccines were available in just 326 days after the sequence was identified, but we all know if the regions are well prepared, the regions can um, respond much, much more rapidly. Um, so just a reminder that this um, request for proposals mm -hmm. has two tracks. It's about uh, clinical research preparedness in West Africa, um, looking at preparing for clinical trials, in particular looking forward to LASA, which is one of CEPI's priority pathogens. And we work in partnership with a number of developers. And the objective here is to ensure that sites are ready for the most promising candidate or candidates moving forward. And then the second area is in relation to evidence generation for readiness for the emergency situation. So the outbreaks that we know occur um, uh, more and more frequently for the next disease X situation, for the next epidemic and pandemic, so that there are sets of, of sites and infrastructures in the region that are ready for to respond to um, an outbreak. Um, in regards to this, I, I think one of the key critical factors is um, that um, there is strong participation and strong leadership from the region. Um, so we are really looking in the context of a technical coordinating part at partner that can coordinate activities um, in uh, with a, a strong regional um, footprint. So as I said, I think we've received quite a lot of strong interest in, in the context of this request for proposal. Um, and we felt it would be um, really advantageous to um, maybe give a, a presentation to show show a little bit more detail of, of really what the objectives are and give the opportunity for people to ask um, questions. So thank you all for um, for joining um, and maybe over to you, Christoph, um, for um, telling everyone a little bit more about the call. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mel. So I guess we can move to the first slide. So before I will provide a brief overview um, of the key objectives of this uh, RFP, uh, maybe we can just walk, uh, have a quick walk th through the agenda to let you know what we are planning today. First of all, housekeeping, um, you have seen it in the chat, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared later on uh, on the Global Health Network platform. We would like to ask you to please use the chat box um, in case you have Further questions, you all had the opportunity to submit questions in advance. We will try to make sure that we answer many, as many as possible today. And obviously, it will not be possible to, to answer all of them, but feel free to, uh, to pose any follow up questions or any new questions um, that come to your mind during uh, the session. And you can also use the QA box to do that. 
due to the number of participants, uh, as usual, uh, we have muted your microphones and the cameras uh, are disabled. But at the end of this uh, webinar, there might be the opportunity um, that we uh, open up for, for questions and let you speak um, to the panel. Uh, therefore, you then should, should raise your hand and we will enable your microphone. But we will uh, announce this separately. The agenda for today, um, thanks again uh, to Mel for the, uh, for the welcome and introduction and these uh, very important uh, key points. Uh, I will have a quick uh, introduction um, around the key objectives for this RFP, as I said, and then we will come to the main part of the webinar today. I will be joined by um, my colleagues, um, Caroline Forkin, she's the head of clinical programs and operations, uh, by Katrin Ramsauer, she is the project lead of the Lassa Disease Program, and by Jacob Kramer, um, who is the director of clinical development at CEPI. And we will uh, go through several of the questions that we have received um, from you over the last days. So maybe we can start uh, with the key objectives uh, of this RFP. I think it makes sense to provide you a bit of a broader picture where we are coming from uh, around our sustained clinical research preparedness strategy. And this is really the result of an extensive stakeholder engagement exercise that we conducted over the last one and a half, two years. Uh, and this here is obviously quite simplified um, figure and table, but this is really the strategy that we envisage. And this strategy consists of two tracks. So first looking at the left-hand side and looking at track A, which we call the peacetime track, the ambition is really um, to have clinical research preparedness in place, capacity in place for clinical research in support of vaccine development in endemic countries. And here the goal is clearly to support CEPI's vaccine portfolio. As most of you, or probably all of you know, we are working on, on different vaccine portfolios, all targeting our priority diseases. And here the goal is clearly to advance this vaccine development for some of these vaccines really up to licensure. Looking at the, the, the right-hand side, track B, the outbreak track, this should be directly informed and directly leverage the work that we conduct under track A uh, to, to track B. Here the ambition is to really have clinical trial infrastructure in the region, in those key target regions, sustained over time, and to have efficient procedures in place to quickly generate evidence in response to health emergencies, wherever and whenever. So this is not really pathogen specific, more region specific. And the goal here is obviously that we directly support CP's 100 days mission. Ideally, but this is all work in progress and will be one of the key pieces that needs to be developed under this RFP, we'll have a warm based clinical research capacity in place in these target regions. And I will come to some of the details for that. I think we are all aware that this um, concept, this strategy, um, and we need to develop concepts further, obviously, will need a multi-regional and multi-level approach. And you can see here, we will start with West Africa, and we have just published this RFP to target this region, because this region and the, uh, the development, uh, the clinical development, advanced stage development of the Lassa vaccine is really important and urgent. We have to start preparations now to uh, put in place or to support the infrastructure that already exists in West Africa uh, to then uh, conduct this um, clinical vaccine efficacy trial under track A, and which would, would like to leverage um, this um, accordingly to, to track B. As I said, this will be part of a tailored multi-level approach. So we have other regions of interest. Um, it's not yet clear which will be the next um, region that we are moving to, uh, but the, the, the intention is really that experiences from this pilot region should inform all other uh, regions uh, that are important and I've just listed uh, some of them here. We can go to the next slide. So this is a very brief summary of the key objectives of this RFP and I think you're all familiar with the RFP text. So the two objectives um, uh, for these two tracks according to the strategy that I have just shown is really for track A and West Africa to prepare clinical trial sites and facilities in these Lassa endemic countries for the GCP compliant conduct of phase three Lassa fever vaccine efficacy trial. This trial, whether it's then a phase three or a phase two B trial, should ideally start 
um, next year to capture the Lassa fever season 24-25, and then probably also the subsequent season 24-26. Uh, season and for track B, we would like to then engage um, uh, engage with a partner and together with us and other partners, um, implement a concept that still needs to be developed to prepare and sustain a number of clinical trial facility, facilities to put procedures in place uh, to explore what stakeholders in this region needs to be involved to then in the future rapidly respond to future health emergencies. To do both of that, and this is obviously something that you've seen in the RFP text, we would like to onboard a consortium which should, let, should be led by a technical coordinating partner to support us in this regard. And the TCP should be the main applicant uh, in response to this RFP. The scope, uh, you can see the consortium here. Again, a simplified figure. We expect this TCP to apply, to come up with suggestions, and we will have uh, some questions that you, that you asked in this regard, and we'll come to that in a, in a minute. We expect this TCP to apply and come up with suggestions for partners in the region that this TCP has already worked with or working experience with. We really expect the TCP to have a strong regional footprint in this regard. That said, it will be also key that this consortium must be opened uh, moving forward for additional partners. Additional partners like additional zeros, like additional partners in the ecosystem in West Africa. And having said that as well, uh, uh, national authorities, as well as public health agencies or um, governments in this region will be part of any broader consortium anyway. So there is no need for uh, national authorities or public health agencies in this region to apply to this RFP because they will be key for moving forward. And all of these partners um, must be brought at one table to then develop concepts for both of these tracks. Very briefly, um, you all have seen the prel very preliminary work package uh, description, and we'll come to that in a minute as well. For track A, as for track B, it will be key to start all engagement with really a very comprehensive landscape assessment of which partners need to be included before we start developing concepts. And then for track A, obviously, we have to shortlist clinical trial sites ba based on very stringent very sound scientific criteria to then uh, come up with the risk analyses, uh, what sites should be um, uh, should be prepared for this GCP compliant uh, clinical trial, monitor the development, and then uh, eventually hand over these sites to the sponsor and we'll um, deep dive into the details. In. For track B, a very different timeline for some of the parts. This is at least what we expect. This is really a long-term approach and we also come to that on the subsequent slides. Uh, but even here, it will be more, even more important that we engage with all stakeholders in, uh, in this ecosystem before we develop, develop concepts. These concepts must really be established by local stakeholders. Next slide, please. And this is already my last slide, but I think one of the most important slides. Um, during our stakeholder engagement, and obviously taking into account the many um, opinions and many perspectives um, over the last um, two years, we really came up with some key principles that are really mandatory in moving forward with this RFP. First of all, obviously, we'd like to sustain this, really try to bridge from routine clinical trials under track A, for example, to long term, to like to involve everybody who's really supporting us in this regard. We have to maximize synergies. We have to align with other funders and other facilitators in the ecosystem. And this it will be very critical for this consortium that you will onboard under this RFP to support us in this regard and be open for, um, for maximizing these synergies to, fi to finding alignments with others. We obviously need to pro promote, and this is really one of the key aspects, I think, we really promote local guidance and local leadership. So we not only have to involve all other regional stakeholders, but we also have to ensure that they have the local ownership, that they can come up with concepts to self-sustain their clinical trial sites, their entities that they represent. And last but not least, we obviously have to align with national priorities and support existing local epidemic pandemic preparedness programs. All of these measures, especially those that are um, developed under track B, must not only be aligned by governance, 
they must be really endorsed by governments moving forward. We get to some of these aspects in more detail. Um, that was the last slide of my presentation. And I think herewith, I will hand over to Karen Forkin, uh, who will lead us through um, the next part of this webinar. Karen, over to you. Great. Thanks, Christoph. And good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. And Jakob and Katrine, if you could also maybe um, go on camera as well for the purpose of the, the questions and answers. And on to the next slide again, please. So as Christoph mentioned, we received quite a number of questions in advance of this session, which was great because it gave us you know, time and opportunity to work through those and see exactly the, the kind of core topics that were um, of most interest to the participants. So we've been able to group those into a number of areas, five main areas really pertaining to the substantive content of the RFP. And then a last area, which is more general questions around the, around some of the uh, logistics, I guess, of the, the RFP submission itself. So we thought it would be good to start in a bit more detail around the scope of the RFP. Christoph already spoke to this at a top level, but again, we got some very probing questions. We have six questions in total. Three on this slide, I think, Christoph, are probably best placed for you to, to respond to. They pertain to really, you know, looking at the tracks, so whether it's possible to uh, apply for one or both, or whether it has to be both, and then specifically a question around track A, and then another specific question around track B in terms of, you know, what, what the shortlisting and preparation of sites in track A and what will you know happen to those ultimately uh, in terms of funding for sustainability beyond this initial track. Um, and then a, a, a more a granularity around what we mean when we describe in the RFP the track B facilities and institutions that could serve as hubs to establish and test emergency evidence generation. So again, you spoke to this in the overview, but maybe if you could work down through these three questions in more detail, that would be great. Sure, thanks, Caroline. So maybe I can start with the first question, which is comparatively um, easy to answer, I think. So I think I pointed out on the previous slides that both tracks are very much in the interdependent. We really want and have to leverage as best as we can those investments that are made um, for track A to really develop concepts for track B. Um, track A already comprises um, a lot of work that is really um, that really must be done in a very challenging environment, and we are obviously facing a very ambitious timeline. We'll come to to a high level timeline moving forward um, in one of the next slides. But track B is equally challenging, and uh, track B will need more time. So we think that applicants to this RFP should really be in a good position and and should be able to show in their application that they have the experience. And that, that they did in the past develop such ambitious um, and innovative concepts under those challenging um, circumstances and really could work on both of these um, to work um, to work through both in this case. The second question, uh, the second question, I think that it's, it's important to, to maybe first send uh, one important message. Um, the the concept or the scope that I have presented on one of the previous slides is by no means final. We are really at the very beginning. We have conducted this very com comprehensive stakeholder engagement over the last years and have included all perspectives so far. We obviously have several ideas how to approach these challenging um, ideas and how to make them happen. Um, and I think have developed a quite good understanding of who in the ecosystem must be involved. But City is a funder and facilitator, and we need the right partners uh, and deep, really depend on those partners to develop those concepts further together with us and particularly with partners in the ecosystem, as I, I think, uh, pointed out. So specifically um, to this question, um, for a trial um, of, of several, probably of several 10,000 sub subjects um, were ideally included um, into this trial in multiple countries, um, we I think we, we need a certain number of shortlisted uh, sites um, that are shortlisted on a sound concept, as I pointed out before. The selection will be then, however, uh, done by the sponsor. Um, and of course, 
um, the cost for the preparation up to a GCP compliant level will be covered by SEPI. That's that's for sure. Um, but in particular, given the timeline, um, we really expect the GCP to apply a staggered approach. So we will start as soon as possible with shortlisting and preparing those sites. But I think, or we think, uh, and again, we still need to develop this concept together with you. Um, I think we need a staggered approach and really have to continue exploring sites based on the epidemiology. And we obviously have very valuable data from the Enable program. Uh, we'll come to that in a minute as well. And then start with first sites and continue exploring and equipping other sites if needed moving forward. Uh, right. yeah. yeah, sorry, Karen. No, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to respond to the, to the latter part of the question too. Um, maybe I can repeat this quickly. For sites not selected to be included in the phase three trial, will these be funded for sustainability with the goal of utilizing these sites for other lesser vaccine? drug trials or interventional trials for other pathogens. Um, maybe very briefly, um, some of these sites will be probably considered for track B moving forward. I think if we need to explore and then equip um, multiple sites, uh, for example, in Nigeria alone, maybe not all of them um, will be a part of, of track B moving forward, but it's obviously a, a, the ambition, as I said previously, that we really would like to sustain our funding. Um, and leverage this further. And to the last question, um, very briefly, track B includes the identification of facilities and institutions that could serve as hubs to establish and test respective emergency evidence generation procedures. Um, so the question here is whether we could um, provide an explanation of what we mean by this. So again, I think the, the, the most important message in this regard is really it's not only about clinical trial sites and not only about site preparedness. We have to um, find concepts on how to establish procedures that could be sustained over time, how we can build an appropriate governance moving forward to be able to respond to future outbreaks quickly, how we build um, programs that really involve existing programs and initiatives that are already ongoing, how we can include networks that are existing. CP is really a connector. Uh, so I think in this regard, we were really um, built on this, on the C in our name, the coalition. Um, and as I said previously, these concepts must be endorsed. Um, and we really need a partner that works together with us on defining those concepts. So it's not on us in this case to, to, to propose uh, the exact scope of work um, for, for Track B, I think. Back to you, Karen. Thanks, Christoph. And if we could move on to the next slide, please. We have three more questions under the, the same topic. So, um, Jakob, I think um, these uh, questions would be good for you to, to respond to the participants on. So, questions specifically around post licensure for provisions component to any of these tracks. Uh, a little bit more granularity on how we envision the work being shared between the technical coordinating partner and the subsequent yet to be awarded sponsor for the phase three efficacy trial. And then uh, a very specific question around the master clinical trial protocol, uh, protocol and whether this is part of uh, of this uh, track A, B or both tracks. So over to you, Jakob. Thank you, Carolyn. I hope you can hear me well. Um, so as probably many of you know, SEPI has developed and initiated a series of activities in support of both its priority pathogen programs, but also in support of this emergency uh, preparedness activity, including the 100 days vaccine library. For example, we have been looking, we still look into a central lab that would provide a series of essays in support of our priority pathogens, but then can also be used to support future clinical research around outbreaks. Um, currently, uh, we are looking for laboratories, for example, on the African continent. So there is additional components within this entire spectrum that should connect into this research preparedness proposal. The same applies to post-licensure pharmacovigilance activities. These will not be part of this particular program. This is really more a, an operational clinical research project. But there is activities and discussions in place with stakeholders uh, to look into 
pharmacovigilance, active passive safety surveillance, but also to look into background incidence rates um, for some of the um, platform technologies that CEPI is supporting, but also some of the pathogens that are on our priority list. And of course, this has to be connected eventually and should be accounted for, um, but it's not part of this particular uh, program. Question number five, um, to elaborate a little bit on the connection of this consortium and particular the, the TCP, the technical coordinating partner, and the yet to be awarded sponsor. We'll come back to, and Katrin, we're very pleased to have uh, Katrin on this call as well as the LASA um, uh, coordinator here within CEPI. But just to say, this is independent, this particular program is independent of the LASA phase three program, but will support and prepare. Uh, so it is the responsibility of the sponsor to eventually select the um, partners, the CRO and, and sites and so on. But of course, um, if this program prepares um, a phase three program, this is why we have selected West Africa as a pilot region for a more global concept. Um, and if, if, you know, at best, we hope that there is a strong link of the yet to be awarded sponsor for the phase three program. And whether or not this goes beyond um, just connecting and handing over or using or communicating, but whether or not this is uh, resulting in, in a, you know, closer partnership is up to the sponsor. We don't want to, you know, steer everything or preclude or predefine things. We want this flexibility. There might be additional partners that will be onboarded over time. Um, so we can only encourage a close connection as early as possible, but it's not part, the phase three trial conduct is not part of this um, particular program. Um, master clinical protocol, um, adapting, tailoring master clinical, a little bit related to the previous question. Of course, we'd like to um, link this consortium, in particular, having that local footprint um, and regional footprint um, and to feed into potential master trial protocol. Again, the procedure, how to conduct this large phase three program and how to award the actual awardee is yet to be discussed and defined. Um, but at best, there is um, connection, you know, you have to account for um, uh, you know, regional aspects and local aspects, and um, at best, the consortium would serve as a source of information. There would be a strong connection uh, into the developer, but developing or revising, reviewing the protocol, uh, again, is not necessarily part of this particular uh, proposal. And maybe just to say on the previous slide, you know, just to say track A, track B, we really believe that those are two sides of the same coin. We, we just don't think that track B, you know, to be prepared in an, you know, not definable emergency situation in future and to be able to generate evidence rapidly will only work if things are in place in, in peacetime. Uh, and uh, this is why kind of in a first step to connect with the countries, with the region. So we kind of hope that the consortium, the first thing they will actually do is pick up the phone and connect with the countries, connect with the regions um, to find out what is already in place. Um, so we really believe this should be coordinated and connected very well. And we do not want to see track A and track B to operate um, in parallel or independently. Back to you, Carolyn. Great, thanks, uh, Jakob. And before we move on to the next slide, just to note, we have seen there is a question in the Q&A, an excellent question. We will address it a little bit further down. We do have a section around the technical coordinating partner characteristics and partner selection. And that's a question that very nicely slots into that particular discussion. So we will address that in due course. If we could move on to the next slide, please. So we thought it would be a good point in time to address some of the questions that we received, which are more, I guess, specific around uh, looking ahead to the actual uh, phase three efficacy trial. And as already mentioned, we, we're fortunate to have Katrine joining us today as the program lead for, for LASA Fever. So Katrine, there are four questions in this section. The first two relate um, specifically really to, to the sponsor um, of the phase three and, you know, the, the sort of 
the identification or not of, of that sponsor at this point in time. The third question then is around whether we envision there just being one or possibly multiple phase three um, clinical trials. And then the fourth one is more specific around how we see the technical coordination partner either adding to or partnering with the existing uh, enable platform that, uh, that is in place and funded by Netlease. So I'll pause there and hand over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. I hope you can hear me well. Yes. So, uh, yeah, as, as uh, Jakob and Christoph mentioned, so I have the pleasure to lead the LASA program within CEPI. And this really is uh, an exciting time for this program. It's the flagship program for CEPI. It's a priority pathogen and it's been on the portfolio from since the very beginning. So we are really eager to move this forward and very excited to, to talk phase three and talk efficacy studies here. So, like, uh, I mean, one, one thing again, I want to point out here and we've said that several times, the actual phase three is not part of the, of the call. But of course, it's not independent. The, um, sponsor of the clinical trial of the phase three trial will be, uh, one of the, uh, partners that is working with the vaccine developers. Um, and what we are doing, so we have a portfolio of, of developers. And uh, some of them are in clinical development, are in phase one studies, and we're closely monitoring uh, the progress of these um, these candidates. We want to make sure that whoever gets down on the ground and gets uh, the um, funding to to run a phase three efficacy study, it will be a large sample size. It will be in the affected areas, will be a safe vaccine, and it will be one that we believe uh, will be effective. We and 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 course, other stakeholders that look at, at data and, and plans. So very clearly, um, so this is a, a process within CEPI where we look at all the data. It's CEPI is, is spending public money. We have to really come with a clear strategy and a clear uh, data assessment to uh, decide for the candidate to move to phase three or for the candidates to move to phase three and eventually to licensure. Um, so to the second question, no, the sponsor has not been uh, defined, but again, we're looking at the data phase one studies are ongoing. The first phase two studies are, are uh, you know, being initiated or planned and will be announced very soon. So there is a lot of progress on the clinical side. And so while uh, we are going through the process of the uh, RFP to initiate and contracting of, of, of the partners here, we, by that time, uh, we will also have a, a partner selected for phase three, and this partner will be involved in, 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 in all of this, of course. Um, will there be multiple phase three trials? So we are, of course, working with the developers. We are, uh, you know, of course, also, uh, we are reliant on, on the timelines they come with. And so currently we are looking into a phase three protocol for a single candidate. But then, uh, you know, as, as time moves on, as we generate the first data, this can be extended to additional candidates. The um, um, actual design of the phase three protocol, this is something that's ongoing. And this has been uh, discussed quite ex intensively in Abuja in, in the fall. I don't know if, if uh, the people on this call had, the, uh, you know, the possibility to go there where the design um, of the phase three protocol was discussed. Uh, and, and so this is currently ongoing, but we are looking into start of the phase three trial for a single candidate currently. And then the last point here, um, is on the enable platform. So the enable study was a CEPI funded, or is it still ongoing? Of course, a CEPI funded epidemiology study, and it's the largest, uh, epi study on NASA so far. And the key objective of this was on the one hand, of course, to collect additional data that will be the basis for phase three efficacy study design or feasibility of the phase three study design. But the second key objective was to build up uh, capacity in the area, to build up sites and know-how that can then be transferred also to, to, to clinical, um, to clinical uh, research. And certainly the enable network is uh, a basis for, for this, for what is coming and that's something that could be expanded. But of course, with the size of the study we're looking into, and then of course the track B of this whole assessment, it is really key to expand this platform. It's it's a small number of sites, particularly if we look into a couple of ten thousand uh, subject study. So we'll need to expand this, but this will certainly and should certainly build on the know-how we we built on on uh, in this enable platform. 
So try to answer these questions here. So please, if you have any, I'm, I'm here uh, through the session, if you have any additional questions to the portfolio uh, or if, if I can answer them, happy to and put them put them in the chat. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Katrine. So hopefully that has clarified uh, some of the questions around the sponsor and uh, other parts of the, the upcoming phase three uh, efficacy study. So we haven't got a question specifically related to this. We have received another question, which I have noted and we will come to that later. So if we move on to the next slide, please. So uh, again, the, the next couple of slides are more specifically around PRAC-A, this this slide, we have three questions here and the subsequent slide around track B, we have a number of specific questions as well. So I think Christoph, if you could address these three questions. So they're, they're quite different um, standalone questions. So the first one pertains to you know, what the, some of the activities um, are they envisioned to be uh, you know, under the scope of the technical coordination partner or you know, as traditionally would be more aligned to the sponsor. Um, in terms of uh, handling those. The second one then is a little bit more granularity on our part around what we mean by initiation of clinical trial site engagement um, and how that fits with respect to the overall timeline of selecting and contracting the TCP. And then uh, thirdly, uh, again, a, a timeline related uh, question with uh, uh, regards to when we expect a work package one to be complete it. Um, so I'll pause there and over to you, Christoph. Thanks, uh, Karen. Yeah, maybe to the first question, um, we, we listed as part of the requirement expectations to the TCP some activities that we think a TCP should be theoretically able to do. And Katrin has just um, spoken to the fact that we have not yet awarded a sponsor. Um, but our vision is really that there will be a very close connection established between the sponsor, the TCP, and the respective consortium as soon as the sponsor has been awarded. And that said, I think it's a, a bit premature to really speak to each of one of these points and whether the one or the other partner will be really in the end responsible. I think for us, it's really important that our partners could deal with those um, activities. Um, but um, what, what for sure we have to guarantee is that we have a very good handover process then in the end from the consortium, from this TCP, then to the eventual um, um, zero, um, obviously that is responsible for the conduct of the phase three vaccine efficacy trial. And all activities that are directly related to this uh, phase three trial are obviously not part of this uh, proposal as Jacob has, has pointed out before. The second question, what do we actually mean by initiation of clinical trial set engagement through the TCP and the consortium? And um, especially given the high level timeline, the high level timeline that we have provided. So maybe very brief, briefly, we, we wanted to provide some idea of, of high level timelines in this RFP. And um, you, you may have seen that this is obviously very, very high level. And by initiation, the, the, the engagement with the sites, this is really um, pointing at the very first um, uh, contact that we would like to make with those sites and all stakeholders in, in the ecosystem in West Africa uh, that we need to involve. And we are aware that the pinements are very um, um, ambitious and perhaps even very optimistic, um, but this should be done directly after um, the contract has been signed by all um, parties. Um, and then must be further conceptualized by, by the TCP. For track B, the timing is different. We have said that, um, but even here we would, would actually envisage that um, we should make a first contact very soon or yeah, at the latest late this year. So the third question, um, by which date do we expect that work package one is, is completed? So first of all, I think it's important to mention that the, the exact scope for work package one still needs to be determined. This is, again, as the, height, the, the timelines just um, to provide you some ideas of what we would expect. This can be further shaped and it will be uh, up to the consortium to really come up with a tangible approach. Um, and this will work will only start uh, in Q3 2023 at the earliest and will obviously take some time. And I don't want to um, uh, provide um, you know, more details on what we think, how much time this will this will need. And this will be again then um, obviously up to the TCP to uh, provide advice on that. For track B, uh, Jakob um, spoke to that. Um, we have a very different timeline. We would like to provide 
substantial um, uh, progress um, by mid of 26. Um, and again, here, this is, this is very much a work in progress. And this is exactly why we need an agile, very flexible partner. Um, and this is yeah, why we are really reluctant to provide very Thanks, Christoph. So if we could go on to the next slide, that takes us nicely into some of the more specific questions around RAC B. So Jakob, I think these questions would be well answered by you and that pertain, you know, largely to timeline questions uh, with respect to the various work packages. So over to you. Yes, as said by Christoph, um, we anticipate that track A is more concrete. Um, there is an urgency. Uh, of course, uh, as described, so we would like to advance with the advanced age clinical development. Um, track B is, as you know, something unprecedented. Um, so we would like to see a concept in place by 2026, simply because this is the end of this um, second funding period for SEPI. We refer to this as SEPI 2.0. So instead of giving you a concrete date, um, there will probably be a fluent shift from hopefully SEPI 2.0 into SEPI 3.0. Um, and the sooner we have something out of this program based on which we can argue for subsequent activities in SEPI 3.0, the better it is. So let me say, if we have something concrete at hand by mid 2026, that would be desirable. Um, but as outlined by Christoph, we have discussed intensely what how this could could be addressed and we came up with these work packages. So how you define and terminate your work packages is um, certainly up to you and, and uh, your discretion and you know to reflect the complexity of individual work packages, which will be stage gated and we'll you know discuss this uh, on an ongoing basis of course. Um, but we would like to see this emergency evidence generation concept um, in place in 2026. We realize this will be an open, a living project, a living document, and there will be subsequent activities. There will be additional partners. It's not our intention to create an exclusive club here once and for all, not at all. It will be open. Uh, and it, there will be further discussions, there will be next steps uh, and so on. Um, but it would be really helpful, let's say, to have in 2026 something in, at hand uh, and also an alignment uh, and communication in place with the region, with the countries, um, to make sure that this is um, actually a viable uh, and useful concept for those uh, partners in, in West Africa. Um, what year and quarter is work package three targeted for completion? I think that goes in the same line. Um, we just try to dissect a little bit the activities and define um, more global work packages in which how in 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 which this could be um, you know distributed, if you will. Um, but we would not like to come up with concrete timelines for individual work packages as discussed uh, repeatedly. Um, we will discuss what has been achieved and these, these will be stage gated. A lot of this, how this is to be stage gated and maybe an overall um, kind of high level time frame is then subject of contractual discussions, but we will not you know, require you or, or, or provide concrete timelines other than saying this work should be um, you know, preparing a phase three trial in sh short to midterm and uh, deliver a concept on track B in, if you will, the long term, long term meaning, I guess, something like three years, 24, 25, 26, um, to help us then, uh, all of us, uh, to proceed. The proposal documents mention a live fire exercise for track B. Could you please provide more information about the expectation around this? So, we also discussed how we could test, not necessarily test how the concept actually works. Of course, this is a little bit the intention, but this will be a process from which we have to learn. And I think we have to constantly review with partners in the region, whether or not these, this meets expectations, whether or not this is in line with 
procedures that are being prepared or already in place in the region and in the countries in West Africa. So as, as a first test, not necessarily of this consortium, but on where we stand all together, um, we felt it might be a good idea to develop some sort of live fire exercise. So kind of an outbreak scenario um, that would reflect risks and needs of that region. So it would make sense to test something that has caused outbreaks or may cause outbreaks in that region is also maybe in line with CEPI's list of priority pathogens or the WHO blueprint list of priority pathogens in that region. Uh, and that scenario is yet to be developed by us um, and should be kind of incorporated. Again, we do see this as a procedure where we all work together, us, other funders, other organizations, uh, the region, this consortium, developers uh, and others, um, and then come up with a test, you know, where do we stand? What needs to be done next? Uh, how can we expand? And let me maybe also say, that this is um, the pilot region for obvious regions, uh, reasons which we mentioned several times now, the Lhasa phase three program, but it is a first pilot region for other regions that we would like to look at. You know that CEPI is looking into other priority pathogens that occur in other regions. And we would like to learn from this region, from the partners um, that work together here to expand into other uh, region and to uh, also connect with Europe, with the US and, and procedures that are in place there uh, to in the end deliver an emergency readiness uh, for future outbreaks in terms of procedures, innovative tools, partners around the table, uh, and so on. Hope this provides some further background on track B, Carolyn. Yeah, it does, Jakob, thanks. Um... And, uh, we're keeping an eye on the, the questions uh, for the participants' awareness. We are aware that there's a number that we need to get to. So uh, on that note, if we move on to the next section, because I think we can address some of the questions here. So this section, as I alluded to earlier on, this is around the TCP characteristics and partner selection. So we have five very uh, substantive, detailed uh, questions around um, this these areas, but um, Christoph, I think you're gonna take this first question, which is quite detailed, but also just before we get into that, I'll read out one of the the, the first question that we got, because as I referred to earlier, this um, it pertains to this, um, uh, this area. So the question from a uh, participant is, just to get some more clarity, can national authorities apply for track A? Also based on what the requirements of track B is it the concept that of national authorities being included as partners in track B without actually applying for it? Thanks. Um, so first of all, and this is also an answer to the, the first two questions or question one and this you know, uh, sub question that we have included here. This RFP is really open to everyone. Everyone can apply to this RFP. We would expect based on what we have said before that the partner, the TCP, that applies to both of these tracks, and as we we have discussed before, we would like we would actually expect that um, the TCP will work on both of these tracks and has cap capabilities of doing so. We would expect that this, that this TCP has a strong local footprint in West Africa, and this should include already existing trustful relationships to local or regional partners uh, in West Africa. That said, we would expect that the TCP will already propose one or two or multiple partners as part of this consortium that applies that he or she that, that this this partner has worked with um, in the past and uh, to, to form this consortium with these partners. Um, this does, however, not exclude the opportunity that other partners are included with this forward. And we specifically reserve the right that we add other partners that we need are necessary to really achieve our goals. Um, we should then secondly, very importantly, I think that make, makes this question so important, should not confuse this with the selection or the shortlisting of those sites. For track A, we will shortlist sites that will be then handed over to handed over um, to the trial zero and the sponsor. And it will be then up to the sponsor to decide which sites are selected for the actual clinical trial. So these sites will form 
let's call it a trial consortium. But the consortium that we would like to onboard, and that, as Jakob just pointed out, can be amended by other partners moving forward and must remain flexible, will work on both tracks, including track B. And track B is not lo only looking into Lhasa endemic countries, but also other countries in West Africa that are not endemic for, um, for Lhasa fever and where we would like to um, establish concepts for, for emergency evidence generation. This is all work in progress. Um, we expect that the TCP should really propose an efficient and sustainable solution um, to SEPI, to our partners, together with our partners, and not the other way. Um, and as, as I said repeatedly, the highest priority is that this is endorsed by governments and ideally really worked out together with governments. So be, before you get into the, the detail of the rest of the questions uh, on this slide, Christoph, Jakob, did you want to add anything uh, to, to what Christoph has just said, particularly with respect to the question we received around the national authority? Yeah, just to underline one as aspect um, here. So we try to take the C in SEPI very seriously. So to really build a coalition for epidemic preparedness innovations. And I felt when I saw this question around the national authorities, whether or not they can also apply, very, very essential. As Christoph said, this is open for everyone, every organization to apply. But I do hope that local partners, regional partners, authorities are part of this anyhow. Whether or not they apply, become part of the consortium uh, or not, this, the region, the authorities, are an integral and essential part of the whole concept. It will not work if there's no strong link and connection into our partners in the region. We have spoken with the Nigeria CDC, for example, we have spoken with the African CDC. There is close connections and this is uh, important that whoever is awarded or forms a consortium will connect and uh, communicate with those authorities itself. So what we really try to do in taking the C seriously is to onboard someone that helps us to develop the concept further. And we just, we discuss this at length, we define some characteristics. We feel that the local ownership, the local footprint is essential, but at the same time, we need someone, you know, that has the track record and experience to conduct clinical research and to sponsor a program but national authorities are a must, you know, as an integral part um, and supporter and, you know, partner in this ecosystem anyhow. Okay. Thanks, Jakob. So maybe back over to you then, Christoph, if you want to uh, carry on with these questions. Yeah, the last question, I think I can really briefly answer. Um, we made this as a requirement, actually, as part of this, this RFP that a zero should be um, included uh, in the application, preferably a regional zero that really has the experience uh, of working in those target countries, especially under track A, but then later also uh, for track B um, in preparing those sites in developing together with um, the potential sponsor, then moving forward community engagement programs and really has the connection already to governments, to health authorities in these countries. And this will be primarily needed then for the subsequent uh, work packages and maybe not primarily for work package one and three, but even for these two work packages and really for the question, how can we conceptualize um, this approach? I think the input for of regional zeros with a good track record of preparing clinical trial sites, of um, engaging with these institutions, whether for therapeutic or vaccine trials, would be really beneficial uh, for such a cons consortium. I hope that uh, answers this question. Thanks, Christoph. And as I mentioned, there are further questions in this section. So if we could have the next slide, please. Great. Um, so I think, uh, Jakob, um, these questions are, are probably uh, Good for you to, to respond to. So the first two, um, again, uh, follow on from the last one around the uh, selection of a, uh, of a CRO and in particular what we're referring to as a global CRO partner and some clarity around, I, I think there's probably some misinterpretation possibly of some parts of the RFP, so we'd like to clarify that. And then 
specifically then um, following on its related question in, in, in question four around a global zero partner, and then specifically uh, straightforward question, I guess, uh, question five with respect to legal status and track, track record of being a sponsor for clinical trials. So over to you, Yeta. Yes, thank you, Carolyn. So um, we have an idea of what this consortium um, should look like to address, you know, the activities, the challenges, and the scope of this work, track A and track B. Um, but as I said, this is a pilot region for something that we have been looking in, kind of somewhat more broader. Um, in terms of harmonizing, preparing for future outbreak scenarios wherever they occur in support of CEPI's 100-day mission. So we feel that for this region, this consortium, it, a, a strong local footprint is required and a local or regional CRO, for example, could provide such a direct link into you know regional authorities regional sites um, and many other areas and knows the region very well um, the what is mentioned in this call we try to put this and provide some more context uh, of what we have in mind for a global context so something if, if this is a pilot region as said uh, and an essential uh, region um, and we look into other regions next to onboard also additional partners and to prepare for other priority pathogens in our list. It needs some elements that harmonize uh, these, this multi-level approach, this multi-regional approach, uh, if you will. So we need some, maybe we, we need some search capacity in future. So if there's a large outbreak somewhere and we have prepared something, and you know, we are stretched or, or the consortium is then stretched in terms of um, capacity, it would be good to have an overarching organization that could rapidly bring in this additional capacity, for example. If we think of some clinical research innovations, some clinical research tools, um, scientific uh, tools or innovative trial elements, for example, um, or some mobile phone app based data capture tools, whatever, it is important that these are somewhat harmonized across different regions. It would be good if in terms of data management procedures, quality management procedures, we have some alignment across these individual components and regions. And for all these things, we felt it's probably good to have a partner or several partners that could provide this harmonization, this search capacity, quality management oversight, which is not part of this particular uh, RFP, but just to mention, you know, that this is part of a, or should become part of a um, wider, more global uh, approach. And that is what we meant with a global CRO partner or global service provider, whatever organization could provide um, these uh, services as listed above. So, I think the selection of global partner, um, I think I answered question two and three with this question, I hope. Um, and the vision, be yeah. So the global CRO partner, we do not request or it's not required for this regional consortium to name the global what we refer to as a global service provider in this particular call. Um, there will be more elements. And as I said, we will also look into other regions. We hope to onboard additional partners through a subsequent RFP for another region and for other elements uh, here. And we will certainly hope uh, that we hope to sit around a table with partners um, that we onboard through this call. But as I said, this is not meant as an exclusive uh, club. We will also a partner and discuss this further with others, but the, the actual global service provider as an organization to connect different regions is not part of this um, particular RFP. Whether or not the TCP must have a legal status and track record of sponsoring clinical trials, yes. So we have been discussing 
recent, very recent outbreaks, and CEPI had been approached to potentially sponsor clinical research activities, and we cannot do that. We are a sponsor, yes, uh, sorry, we are, we are funder, and we do facilitate a lot of activities, but we will not and we do cannot sponsor clinical research. So we already discussed the phase three, and we will hear more from, from Katrin about the LASA phase three um, program, um, but uh, it's the intention is that our developers will sponsor this, but what is going to happen with a future outbreak, maybe a multi-country outbreak, maybe an outbreak affecting several regions on the African continent, we need to maintain some flexibility uh, on who can rapidly adopt such a sponsor role. So yes, it must be a legal entity, it must have a track record of sponsoring not just clinical research, but vaccine trials. Uh, and as you know, this is also something that has to be seen in a more broader and more global context. Um, so we will also certainly um, discuss respective activities uh, and plans with WHO, but certainly also with the African CDC, with regional partners, Nigeria CDC, uh, and so on. Back thanks. to you, Carol. Yeah, thanks, Jakob. A uh, very comprehensive answer. And just before we move on to the next slide, which is kind of more general questions, then we had one question in the chat, uh, Jakob, and I'll probably give it to you. In fact, you just touched on, on some, of, some of it already. So the question is, do you anticipate synergies between this RFP and the ongoing NEPAD Africa CDC, EDCTP, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation reflection on optimizing the African clinical trial ecosystem? And if so, how exactly? And actually, Christopher and I are just up, off uh, a plane from a conference in South Africa on that exact to topic, the African clinical trial ecosystem. So you, you touched on most of these elements, Jakob, but is there anything uh, in addition you wanted to, to add to this in terms of how we envision uh, the synergies working? Well, I think th this is a really good, or I'm, I'm, uh, these are all good questions, but I'm re very ha happy that we got this question because it again allows us to, to state that we do not only anticipate synergies, but we hope and we plan for synergies. To be very clear again, we do not want to invent or reinvent anything that is already in place. There, we, we are completely aware of long track and multi-year investments and collaborations on strengthening clinical research uh, in these regions, but also in other low and middle income countries, uh, and also in, for example, Europe and other regions. So we want to leverage on all of this. We want to bring these things together. Uh, and if anything, this is not just about strengthening clinical sites. Uh, it is really about establishing procedures and to find ways and to connect partners to allow more rapid evidence generation in future outbreaks. We often quote um, Jeremy Farrar, who has said, you know, in an emergency situation, those things worked well that had been in place before. And that is really what we have in mind. So we discuss with the African CDC. We are in discussions with Nigeria CDC. We are, of course, connected to EDCTP and well aware of what they have been supporting so far. And yes, we do discuss this with other funding organizations, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, including Wellcome Trust, and including many others, um, and hope to align and bring everyone around the table uh, uh, to leverage efficiencies, to find efficiencies, and to connect. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. As you said, very central to everything we're doing with respect to this, this approach, but a great question to see reflected from the participants. So could we move on to the last section then? So we have four general questions and I think, uh, uh, Christoph, you're best placed to respond to these. But before you, you uh, get started, there's a couple of questions uh, in the Q&A as well that relate to this as well, uh, that I think we can also address. So really related to the work packages. So uh, first of all, one participant is wondering where the um, details of the work packages are. I think we can clarify that uh, very easily with respect to the appendix um, and the name of the appendix. And then secondly, please, can you quickly outline the work packages? Uh, again, I, I think we did some of that throughout the, throughout the discussion so far, but also in providing the pointer to the appendix, we can hopefully um, uh, direct participants to that. But Christopher, 
leave it up to you whether you want to kind of outline them at a high level again, but uh, but we may have already done that. And then the third question, uh, again, it's related to the work packages and the detail is probably in, in, enclosed there within the appendix, um, but uh, I'll, I'll detail the question anyway. Is clinical support included in the scope of work for this RFP or is it limited to what is outlined in work packages one and three? So again, a question that you can probably speak to uh, as well in this session, um, Christoph. So again, as I said, um, four questions here. Um, some around the detail of page limits, et cetera, and then uh, another question about work packages one and three, and then about whether the, the award might potentially be shared. Um, and sorry, first question with respect to very high level timeline. So over to you, Christoph. So, so to answer the first questions, maybe, um, I think it would be most helpful to refer to Appendix C, which has been published along with the RFP text on CP's website. In case there are any other pending or other questions um, related to that, please reach out uh, via our email address for this RFP. We will show this email address, I think, later on, and we can put it in the chat. But this should be actually quite informative uh, for you. And uh, again, this is not the entire scope of work. This is all work in progress. This is just to provide you with a high-level idea of what we are talking about when we talk about these work packages. So the first question here on this slide, um, I think we, we, we talked about timelines and we, for good reasons, only provided very high level timelines. And uh, I think for good reasons, we'll not um, provide any more specific dates um, or due dates for, for each of these work packages. And I hope for your understanding. Is the page limit uh, 10 pages in total? So this, uh, this can be quickly answered. Um, we would expect I mean, we, we need applications that are concise. We need to review all of these applications in a very short time frame because we are working on such ambitious timelines. Um, but we also want to provide you with the opportunity to um, provide additional information. So we would ask you to complete the application template in not more than 10 pages. And then you can add other appendices or um, uh, other supporting information that you think uh, might be needed for evaluation of these uh, of this proposal or this application, um, but we would really ask you to point out the key messages that you would like to convey in these um, uh, 10 pages that we have provided. And a very important question, I think, is question number three. We noticed that work packages one and three were not included in the proposal template outline, and we assume that you would like detailed responses indicating how the applicants intend to uh, intend on implementing those work packages. So we, for good reasons, did not include uh, these two work packages, and we did not ask to um, to really come up with concrete solutions or concrete proposals of how these how, how this work could look like or how the concept could look like under these two tracks. We would, of course, welcome information on the ability of the TCP and the consortium uh, on how to implement those concepts, um, but we still need to develop them. And to ask for concrete concepts at this stage um, of this entire process would really contradict a bit what we have said before, the inclusion of partners in the region. We need to listen to those partners first before we, we come up with concrete next steps. So we are really asking for a very concise, very good explanation or provision of, for, for information of what the TCP and the consortium can do, what they have done in the past, where they have particular strength in terms of these two tracks and how they would organize their work. And I think we have provided several points in the application template um, uh, that could be completed in this regard. If there are further questions, again, I'm very happy to answer any questions then by email. The last question, the award could be potentially shared, but our ambition now is really to onboard one consortium led by one technical coordinator partner um, and um, add other partners moving forward if necessary, and we will certainly add other partners from everything what we know so far. Um, I think I hope that that answers this question as well. Yeah, thanks, Christoph. There was a question actually in the chat in the last few minutes: Is there a possibility of combining applicants to form a consortium? So obviously, this is the RFP itself is for a consortium, but maybe the, that uh, question relates to the last question here as well, which I think you've just answered. So we would be looking potentially to add uh, other 
other partners as it moves forward. There's, we've answered all questions, but one last question just came in, uh, which I'm not sure we're going to be able to um, answer um, uh, today, but I'll open it up um, anyway. Is there a budget ceiling? Is the last question that just came in in the last few minutes. So maybe Jakob. Yes, I mean, so, well, of course, we need to household uh, with our budget and we have planned uh, accordingly. But we decided against uh, putting a certain budget uh, in the call text. Um, we are aware that this is um, a lot in particular on track B is an unprecedented project and kind of uh, something that um, we look into that we will learn from and then have to react, um, adapt and uh, move forward. So we decided against uh, putting up or publishing a certain budget, um, but really ask you to um, come up yourself what you feel is um, justified uh, for a first concept or for a concept for track B, but also for a preparedness for phase three program in West Africa. But just to say, um, we are aware that this may trigger additional activities. This is just a start. We would like to look into this. I mean, something like this, I think it would be unrealistic if we would say, you know, here's a call, here's a certain budget. And then in 2026, we have a fully baked concept that will once and for all stand and prepare us well for outbreaks uh, in this region and beyond. Uh, that's not the case and it would be unrealistic. So this will trigger and hopefully help us to deep dive into this further, to react, to expand, to revise uh, over the, the years. It's really a multi-year and probably project that goes way beyond the time frame that we have proposed. Um, and if we fall short, if there's additional partners, additional activities that we all together feel are important to be included as we go along, we will always, you know, go ahead and try to support this. Um, but we would, together with our partners and together with partners in the regions, uh, build arguments around this and integrate this in a concept. So there's always flexibility um, moving forward. Uh, but as said, uh, we really wanted to put this up um, as it is now for now without a certain budget um, published. Um, so really looking forward to, to you know, seeing what you submit and then to discuss this further. Maybe yeah, sorry, Christoph, go ahead. Simon, um, maybe to clarify for the budget, I mean, we only ask for a high level estimate for, for the budget for work package one and three. And obviously, as Jakob mentioned previously, we will stage gate the entire program then moving forward. And we will ask as part of the due diligence for this project, uh, which will be carried out after selection of one, two, or three proposals moving into this due, di due diligence process, ask for a more detailed budget. But for now, it's sufficient to just provide high. Thanks, Christoph. So we have answered uh, all of the questions that we got live through the Q&A throughout. I hope they're to the satisfaction of everybody who posted a question. I think, as you said at the outset, Christoph, we're happy to take subsequent questions uh, as well. Um, uh, and that we would, um, you know, uh, uh, publish the, those answers, uh, all of the answers, um, uh, on the the TGHN hub as well as the recording of this uh, of this um, webinar. But uh, Christoph, um, I think Lewis has put in the chat if anybody, uh, any of the participants would still like to ask a question verbally, uh, we have the option for people to raise their hands and and ask uh, and ask a live question. I see there might be one more. Um, okay, there is a question in the in the chat. So could you please explain CEPI's interpretation of establish and test respective emergency evidence generation procedures? So I think we got a question similar to that, which we answered, but um, obviously a little bit more clarity required. Shall I give it a first try and then maybe oh. others come, come in? Um, as said, you know, you can, this is certainly about site and capacity building and to have a site 
network in place. But this is also about procedures. And we are looking into this as well and uh, around the 100 days. And there is you know, other elements, as said, someone asked about post-approval vaccine safety exercise. So th it's a whole concept which we'd like to test more concretely around this live fire exercise and to see what we have in place around procedures, for example, um, we could think of a certain pathogen, a certain outbreak that we describe, and you know that this region has been affected by a multi-country Ebola outbreak uh, some years ago. There have been cases of Marburg virus that have been described and observed in this region. Uh, other pathogens uh, occur as well, and we may define um, such an outbreak in the end, and then in partnership, again, not to test this consortium or to test the uh, actual concept, but really to learn from where do we stand? Um, would it now allow us to react very rapidly in a future outbreak? Um, this is something that we develop and we could think of a certain scenario that we come up and then as you know, jointly around the table, see whether what we have in place by 2026 covers this and would allow us to generate evidence very rapidly. Questions that we would like to address with this operational concept then could include, but I'm just making these up just now, you can certainly think of uh, questions yourself or aspects yourself, is things like you know, regulatory contacts, approval timelines, turnaround timelines, import, export, you know, shipments to maybe laboratories that we have established by then on the African continents, but maybe in other countries. So cross-border shipment of lab samples, um, certificate of A analyses, uh, import, uh, you know, of drug, uh, of, of uh, vaccines, for example, in a country, but also procedures on how should data be generated, data be managed? What are some innovative tools maybe that can be fed into such a proposal that will speed up things and that can be harmonized across regions? Um, do we need procedures? What is maybe, um, we, we discussed on this call different sites, but um, we would of course like to prepare additional sites, but we could also think of maybe multiple hubs in that region that would serve uh, to train the trainer and, for, uh, and other things. So what are procedures that would allow a cross-country collaboration? What are procedures in place? So all of this, um, these are things and aspects, maybe in partnership with authorities in the region that we would like to develop um, to see where we stand in 2026. That is maybe a little bit to describe um, this, what we mean by live fire exercise uh, today. But again, this is to be just established and developed further jointly. Um, and it's really just to maybe lead over from this project then into subsequent activities to deep dive uh, into this and take this further over subsequent years. Thanks, Jakob. Yeah, comprehensive answer. So at this stage, we're, we're almost at the end of the session. So Christoph, back over to you. I think we've had, yeah, excellent questions in advance and some excellent questions throughout as well. We have answered, I think, in some way, shape or form, all of the questions. Some of them overlapped, so um, hopefully between between all of the panellists, um, most answers have, have been given. So, Christoph, do you want to uh, give the closing remarks in terms of next steps? Yeah, thank you very much, Caroline, and thanks all attending this session. Um, as I said previously, please feel free to reach out with further questions. Um, you can contact us at any time. Uh, I hope we have answered most of the questions. Um, otherwise, again, contact us and uh, thanks a lot uh, for, for your attendance today. I don't know whether there are any other remarks by my colleagues or anything else. Otherwise, um, uh, no, it was a great, a great session, and I think um, in, in the chat we've now put in some of the relevant links to, to the RFP again and to the email uh, with respect to any follow questions that people may want to post uh, directly to us as well. We should maybe mention um, at the very last that we will um, publish the recording of the session on the TETTGH and Hub um, as soon as possible, uh, presumably next week. And we will also try to publish questions and answers in a written form as soon as possible for you to read again through. 
and there will be another session in the days for those who have registered twice. Okay, then I think we can close the meeting. Again, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks to my colleagues and thanks to you for um, for your presence today. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend.